All right, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. All right, excellent. It looks like a lot of people got the message that we're meeting in person. Uh, do uh, spread that message around to anyone else that you know that uh, didn't make it this morning. Um, welcome. Welcome back to our first in-person meeting in two and a half years or so. Um, and we definitely want to extend a special thanks to the Sanford Burnham Prebis uh, Medical Discovery Institute for allowing us to meet here. So to kick off the meeting today, we're going to have uh, Gene, uh, who you all might remember, uh, say a few words. We, we hope. I'm, uh, because my legs don't work anymore, I'm just going to sit here and talk to you a little bit. What I thought I would do is reintroduce you to all the people that are making this uh, organization work. Uh, I'm Eugene Van Vliet, or Gene is known. I'm 83 years old and I've been dealing with this disease for 20 years. Uh, I found and became active in this support group 16 years ago, probably one of the primary reasons I'm still talking to you. Uh, so to in, uh, introduce the current staff, if you would you wave your arm or something so somebody can see your face to remember who you are. First of all, uh, Bill Lewis, who's a, a director and president, and he's doing an awfully good job and uh, being very active, helping with marketing, and uh, he's done a lot of things to help us, uh, especially when we were doing live streaming, getting out some marketing stuff to try to get get uh, people involved. Uh, next, of course, is Aaron Lamb, uh, who is a director and facilitator of the meetings. And he did, a, those of you that watched the live streaming meetings, he was the man that uh, uh, held those meetings and did an awfully good job of it. He really did. Uh, next is uh, Bill Manning up in the back behind the camera as usual. He is a director and videographer and he makes DVDs of all our meetings and uh, have provided a lot of help in getting the live stream meetings alive uh, on YouTube. And uh, then, uh, Steve Pendergast, where did you sit down? There you are, there where you are, leave your arm. Steve's the secretary of the corporation and he's the editor of the monthly newsletter and he's done a great job in providing the latest information on our disease and he continued to do that during COVID-19. So you've, you've done a great job for us, Steve. Um, a greeter, you can't see him out there, there he is, Bob Stacy has a recent volunteer to uh, be a greeter for our meetings. Uh, he may have troubles doing it every meeting. Uh, so uh, if you could get involved, please let Bill or me know in case that uh, Bob is unable to make the meeting. Okay. Uh, I should mention uh, John Tassie. He used to be at all our meetings, who developed our website, if you may recall. Uh, he still maintains our website even though he's retired and moved to Branson, Missouri, where all the country western people are. <laughs> right. So uh, uh, to get us going, you might have noticed that there's no library out front anymore. Uh, the person that handled it uh, wouldn't respond. Uh, so uh, you'll remember it has a lot of useful information, recent books. Uh, and uh, we really need somebody to help us with that. I still have all of the uh, information at my house, which I can't even move. Uh, so we really need somebody to help because there's a lot of good information you can pick up and read and keep. And we buy books to on the latest uh, publications and so forth that you can uh, uh, buy from the library. Uh, out there on the tables that are out there now, uh, please notice that we put the uh, a bunch of bumper stickers, which was one of the efforts that uh, <coughs> Bill came up with. Uh, so there's a bunch of those out there. And uh, uh, brochures are out there as well. We'd like for you to pick up some brochures, put a few in your church, at your doctor's office, give them to your friends, so forth, just to get information around that we exist and we do a heck of a job of what we do. Uh, I also put out on the table uh, uh, some information that was uh, uh, written up by uh, uh, John Duvall, who just finished his first treatment of lutetium-177, which is the most modern treatment 
for those of us that have uh, uh, serious metastatic conditions. Uh, so uh, I put copies out there, read it. It's very interesting. Where are you, John? Are you here today? Yeah. There you are, right there. Thank you for doing that. That's, that's good information. And uh, we know for sure that it's going to be done at UCL, uh, UCSD. That's where you went, right? And some of them may remember a Dr. Kipper that's spoken to us several times. I understand that he has uh, capability to do that up in Temecula where he has an office now. So that's it for me. Get the meeting going. All right. All right thanks a lot, Gene. Let's see. So uh, there should be, hopefully, a lot of newcomers here today that have not been uh, with our group before. Um, uh, Bob hopefully caught you at the door, gave you a, a newcomer packet. Um, please raise your hand if you did not get one of those and you're uh, new to the group here, because we would like to, you to especially fill out the yellow cover sheet today, return that to us so that we can um, get in contact with you. Except it's white. Except that it's white. Yeah, yeah, who, who actually is, is new here today? Excellent, excellent. Quite a few well, good people. And, do, and do, did you all get the newcomer packet? Does anyone need it? All right, great, great. Um, and so, yeah, that welcome, uh, uh, that welcome packet includes also an information kit with some articles and booklets. And, um, and Gene or Bill will likely give you a call in the next week uh, to, um, to, I guess, get your story, uh, help you out with uh, what uh, information you're looking for. So um, those of you who are returning members might remember um, that uh, it was a different face up here uh, a couple years ago. Um, George Johnson used to be our facilitator, and um, sad to say that if you did not know, he did pass away. But one of the things I loved about our meetings um, uh, that I remember from the very first meeting that I came to five years ago was he would have everybody in the audience raise their hand so that you could get a better understanding of, of the background of everyone here. Um, you know, whether people are new, whether they've been fighting this for 20 years, what types of treatments they've had. And, and as you raise your hands and look around when I ask these questions, you know, take a look at somebody else around that, that you know, maybe is a newcomer that you wanna uh, touch base with if, if, if you've been dealing with this for a long time because you remember back to uh, what things were like when um, when you walked into this room for the first time, um, as well as you know who might have experienced some treatment that uh, you're considering as well. So we did see already uh, who has been here for the first time, um, and I assume that those are all people who are have been recently diagnosed. Um, how about uh, can you raise your hand if um, you had radiation? That's Quite a lot of you here. Um, how about ADT and hormone therapy? Excellent. Um, sorry, I have I, I've confused a little bit of my slides here as I've been updating them. Uh, that's actually on the next page. So let's look at the right hand column for a moment. Who's had uh, prostate cancer for less than one year? All right, um, four or fewer years. All right, yeah, you'll keep your hands up. Uh, oh, 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 sorry, um, yeah, one to four years, I should have said. All right, how about five to 10? Quite a few of us, quite a few of us. 11 to 15? Quite a few still. And how about higher than that? How many years? 18, 20 years? 16 years? 17, 17. So, oh, 25, who had 25? All right, you're the winner, you're the winner. Yeah. So the message with this is that, um, you, you might have seen on the very first slide, prostate cancer is two words, it's not a sentence. You know, you still have, especially for you newcomers, you still have a long life ahead of you. Um, there are just incredible treatment options. I mean, we have somebody in the audience who is receiving the actual cutting edge treatment um, right now, and you've come to the right place to find out more. Um, so now for the treatment survey. Who, who is on active surveillance? All right, excellent. And uh, surgery? Who has had surgery in the past? Oh, quite a few there as well. Radiation? Uh, yeah, once again, yeah. And ADT, 
hormone therapy, yes, qu quite popular um, treatments these days. Who's received new treatments? And I'm not really sure what George always meant by the new treatments. Sometimes he would say um, new. Uh, new treatments. Beyond Some, standard yeah, yeah. Okay, Zyti and any of the extras to go with it. Yeah, because I, I received Zytiga at the same time as Lupron for two years, and I just considered that all ADT, but you know, back then Zytiga was actually pretty advanced. Yeah, um, so yeah, sorry, one more sign of, of everybody that has been on those more advanced treatments. Yeah, um, and I, oh, Provenge, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and lutetium, yeah. Um, I, one I didn't have up here, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, chemotherapy. Yes, there's still a number of people that have had chemotherapy for this. Um, how many people are dealing with recurrence? They treated before and now it's come back. Yeah, it does happen. I mean, and, and also recognize, you know, it's not necessarily that 30% of the audience or so will will experience uh, recurrence. The people that are here today are interested in dealing with their recurrence. And there's likely 90% of prostate cancer patients that have, have not experienced recurrence that are uh, cured and they're not showing up today. So there is a lot of hope for actually curing the cancer that you have and have it never coming back. How many people today are undecided about what their next step should be in their treatment? Yeah. So I expect that a lot of you will have questions, especially for Bill when uh, he starts uh, um, uh, speaking a little bit later. So a new slide that I've added of my own, because you know we're not just dealing with um, just prostate cancer here. We're also we're dealing with a whole body issue. And you know, I'm proud to say that I sought out therapy. I needed therapy when I found out that I had prostate cancer. And I'm curious, especially with this being um, uh, mental, wellness aware, uh, mental wellness uh, awareness month, um, how many people sought out therapy when they learned that they had prostate cancer? Excellent, excellent. Congratul thank you for doing that, and thank you for sharing that. I, I, to, for me, that was one of the most important uh, things that, that I needed. I was single at the time. Um, I, I did not have people that, around me that were good at making you know, medical decisions. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I had essentially another advocate in that therapist who was looking out for my well-being uh, through this whole journey. Um, how about people who have also had procedures to address incontinence? Excellent. Yeah, it is certainly something that we have to deal with on the whole recover recovery side of things, getting back to a normal life. And how about sexual wellness treatment? Yes, fewer, but yes, we do have sexual issues that we have to address, and there are ways to address it. And I encourage you to ask me about it, ask others about it. Um, it's, it's an important part of our healthy life to return to. Now, how did you all get here? Who saw the ad in the Union Tribune? Anyone, anyone? All right, excellent. And, and for you newcomers, was it the Union Tribune that, that uh, you saw the Union Tribune article that brought you here? Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't. Um, uh, who was referred by word of mouth from another patient? Excellent, excellent. Um, referred by one of their medical professionals. Excellent. Can I ask who, um, who referred you? What doctor? Or? Um, yeah, it's the Kaiser, they have referred me. Oh, excellent, excellent. Okay, and there was another hand over here. Who referred you here? Okay, excellent. It's glad to hear that those doctors are sending us uh, uh, this way, um, sending you guys this way. Um, who's, who found us on a Google search or, all right, and how about Facebook search? And on the Facebook, which I don't think we're running anymore anyway, so that was a little bit of an old one. Did anyone see the grocery store receipt, the back of it where there's many times many coupons? We uh, ran some ads there. Okay. Um, and uh, how many people have seen our bumper stickers or our trifold brochures? Not just in the uh, driveway out here, I hope, but you've seen them in the past? Yes, 
yeah, they're they're nice and big, you know, to hopefully get the message out there to uh, to try to uh, um, uh, join the group and get tested. Um, how many had a, a spouse that discovered us and dragged you in here today? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for the women and the spouses, the partners uh, for. Um, you're all as much a part of this uh, a journey as the actual patient. Um, and any other ways that you found out about the group? Oh, okay. So from the support group there, they also, oh, excellent. And back here? Email. Email. Okay. All right. Excellent. So our support to you, as you have probably seen, comes in the way of the website. Um, there you can also find the monthly newsletters that get me, uh, emailed out to everybody that is on our mailing list. Those are a wealth of information. As uh, Jean said before, Stephen does a fantastic job of putting those together every month. A lot of excellent uh, information there. And uh, we do have now in-person meetings, not video streaming. I need to still update my slides. Um, and we do have the, the hotlines. Um, Jean and Bill both have their phone numbers up here. Uh, especially newcomers, you know, you can contact these guys and they can help put you uh, in touch with the information that uh, can help answer your questions. And for the, the women, the family and caregivers, um, Sharon, who is, sh is Sharon here today? I've actually never met her myself. Um, she has graciously uh, offered to take calls uh, from the caregivers. Now, um, we do need volunteers. Uh, we would we love to have people come and share their experiences. We have a couple of round tables once or twice a year uh, where uh, pe uh, people from the, uh, this audience uh, share their, um, their journeys, their recent uh, treatment experiences, and it is incredibly useful uh, for those who have not attended. It is, it, when I walked into this room uh, five years ago, I didn't know what was going on. I, I thought I was done. I just had surgery. The doctor told me, nope, sorry, you're stage four. And I had no idea where I was. And at that first meeting, three guys got up here and they said, this was my PSA. This is how it, it, it trended. This is the treatments that I had, and this is where I am today. And I could go, ah, that was where I was and that's where I could see myself being in five years. And it was so reassuring. Um, and even before we have one of those round tables, you know, that's the type of, of thing to identify with somebody else in this room, as somebody who, has, who, who was in a similar situation uh, uh, that you are now and, and can help you focus on um, returning to normal in a, a few years. Question here. Uh, I'd like to make a comment because uh, I've been with this group for several years. And uh, my treatment has been optimal, and it's due to having listened to several people who came in to lecture or lecture during the pandemic. And, and that I could match my, my symptoms with that caregiver. I think that is a great contribution of this group. Yeah, that is a great point. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, um, yeah, you certainly get to experience the different doctors and and see which ones will be uh, best fit to your situation. Yeah, um, we are also, as as Jean said, looking for someone to help out uh, part time as the greeter and as the librarian. Please do contact these guys if. Um, if uh, you are willing to take on those roles. And of course, contact us anytime that you have questions. Now, I wanna remind everybody that we share patient-focused experience on becoming your own case manager through informing, networking, and caring. We are a group of experienced participants, but we are not medical professionals, and any sharing by anyone of our group may not be a substitute for your own medical counsel. And we do need your support. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. If I could have a couple of volunteers, these baskets haven't been used in a long time. So we're going to send the baskets around uh, 30 times because that's the number of times that we've missed. Um, but I, I want you to take a, a minute to, to uh, think about the, the support that you've gotten from this group um, over the years uh, uh, while we've been away on the Zoom meetings and so forth. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's been uh, extremely valuable advice. Uh, 
you know, more time spent uh, answering your questions than some of the doctors that we pay hundreds of dollars to uh, each time we go to visit. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, your, your support is used, uh, sorry, it, the donations are tax deductible. We don't have any medical or religious affiliations. Um, we do have a lot of the same expenses with advertising and the video streaming, the, the, um, uh, the website, et cetera. Uh, and if you can't make a donation today, always feel free to make a donation through the website. You can do that via PayPal or sending a check in the mail. And that address is available um, online. And um, let's see, as we're doing that, uh, yeah, our upcoming meeting next month, you, you might have heard that uh, Dr. Uh, Kamrava was going to be this month, but because of the bit of last minute surprise that we're going to be in person moving forward, he could only do it next month. So we will be seeing him on November 19th. Uh, he'll be talking about high and low dose uh, rate brachytherapy. Um, now, before we... Um, uh, before we, I introduce our speaker, something that I skipped was um, I wanted you just to, to take a moment to think about what we've been through in the last two and a half years. What has happened to you in that time? And I want everyone to take a minute to close your eyes with me. Take a deep breath, deep, slow breath. I know there's a lot of excitement in the room to get our questions answered, um, and and they will get answered. You know, there's a lot of uh, information to share uh, today, but I want you to thank uh, all those that were patient uh, with with you and caring for you the last couple of years. Thank yourself for coming here today, the strength you, you've found in yourself already since you've been diagnosed, and taking the time to invest in your own health. Um, Lost my place. And to invest in the health of those patients around you to trust in our organization. So thank you. And you know what? I want everyone to give themselves a round of applause, a round of applause for all these guys that is, have carried us through the last couple of years. Thank you so much. Okay, and so now we come to Dr. Bill Lewis, uh, president of the IPCSG, who will be giving us a wonderful presentation on surviving aggressive prostate cancer. Bill, thank you. I'll pick up the laser pointer if you'd like. Okay. Just press, uh, oh. <laughs> I think I turned it on. There we go. There we go. All right. <laughs> thank you, Aaron. I'm I've been very excited about this upcoming meeting for quite some time now, and I hope that the effort that I've put in to prepare this w uh, will work out for you. I've asked Aaron to keep reminding me to keep the microphone up to my face. It's, it's hard to remember that. Okay, so I put the title uh, with brackets around aggressive because I want to talk about surviving all prostate cancer. I want to start by uh, introducing myself uh, through my children. And my wife is a great storyteller, and so I'm going to cheat and use her write-up about some of these uh, people that you see in the pictures. When David, the upper left, was four and in, pre in preschool, his teacher asked him to draw a picture of his own face. It's common for teachers to want the child to draw a picture of their face in the beginning of the year and then again at the end of the year so that they can show the child's maturity by how much more detail the face has. David didn't want to. But the teacher insisted. He finally took a piece of uh, paper and some crayons. He colored the whole sheet black. The teacher asked what he was doing, and he said, it's a picture of me in a dark room, <laughs> four years old. Michael, on uh, the middle, on the bottom, was five when I taught him to ride a bicycle. He went off pedaling on his own, but he was very concerned about a prickle bush 50 yards down the street on the other side. Of course, because he was fixated on the bush, <clears throat> he wobbled diagonally across the road and fell right into the prickle bush. He left the bike right there and marched back to me. Before I could say, that's all right, let's try again. Michael said, sell it. I'm never going to ride it again. He declared that he would walk, 
wherever he needed to go, even when he became a teenager. He never rode again for two full years. We should have sold the bicycle because it, by then it was too small for him. One day, a friend and I took uh, all of our younger children to Disneyland. After the last show of the evening in an amphitheater on the far side of Disneyland, we jumped on the train to return to the front gate. When we got there, we realized that we had left my little three-year-old Annie, lower right corner, <clears throat> back at the other train station. I started to try to have the station agent call back to the other train station. My friend went running for the lost child room to report the problem, carrying his two kids, one under each arm. On the way there, one of his boys looked ahead and said, look, Dad, there's Annie. He went running up to Annie and asked, how did you get here? She said, I had to walk. You guys ditched me. <laughs> he asked, did anyone try to help you? She said, one mom asked me if I was lost, and I told her no, and just kept walking. <laughs> 10 o'clock at night, clear across Disneyland. <laughs> Michael had a hamster, that's Michael in the middle again, when he was eight. He took it to Cub Scouts, and one of the leaders looked at it and said, oh, what's his name? Michael said, TLC. She said, oh, how sweet, tender, loving care. Michael retorted, no, tastes like chicken. When David was 12, he read David Upper Left. He read Lord of the Rings books by J.R.R. Tolkien. Those runes you see on the bottom of the slide represent the letters of the dwarvish alphabet that Tolkien invented. David memorized those, as well as the alphabet for Elvish, and could read and write both languages. <clears throat> These children are the reasons I'm a little strange. You know, insanity is hereditary. You get it from your kids. <laughs> and then I would comment that when they became adults, the girls became more beautiful and the boys grew long hair and beards. Oop. I hope there's a back. Okay, I have a family history of prostate cancer. My father died of it, my, both my grandfathers had it, and uncles on both sides had it, and in some cases died of it. I had a few prior health problems when I came across uh, my problem with prostate cancer. I was depressed for 15 or 20 years. I had anxiety for 10 years, the kind where you curl up in a fetal position until it passes. I had yeast overgrowth and wore a scarf around my neck for 30 years, day and night, summer and winter, wherever I went. I went bankrupt in my business. I had a heart attack in 2011. I had lots of business stress, being uh, an entrepreneur. I had uh, initially frequent urination, and I'll talk in a minute about what happened about that. Uh, I don't have a continence problem anymore. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, I also had a period of no insurance because of the business uh, uh, failure, and I finally got an out-of-pocket PSA test saying, I've got all of these relatives, maybe I should get a PSA test. It was 18 when I got tested for the first time in five years. It had been 1.7 before that, which by the way, if you're over 45 and you get a PSA of 1.7, it's, it's an indicator that you're likely headed for prostate cancer. So my journey uh, really began in November 2015. Uh, after I did get insurance again, uh, my PSA uh, turned up to be 10. I got a, um, an MRI, it was showed a suspicious spot, I got an MRI-guided biopsy, which showed Gleason 9. Uh, uh, that's pretty serious. And then I went for a bone scan and found that I had a dozen metastases. Then I went to a urologist uh, who said, by the way, you seem to have a, some urine retention, 920 cc's, when normal is 400. Since then, I've used a catheter 10,000 times five times a day on average. My low point was the following year in May. 
after trying some um, uh, alternative medicine approach with a doctor friend of mine, I ended up with 100 metastases. This is what they call a super scan, which in doctor speak means super awful. My PSA went to 71, and with, under those conditions, I had a six to nine month life expectancy. So I altered course uh, and began to use information on the internet that said that triple androgen blockade was a very helpful thing to do. That consisted of Lupron, Casodex, and Avidart, or Proscar. Proscar. Um, and I also uh, went heavy on the supplements, and I went heavy on some lifestyle choices. Uh, let's see, there, here we go. Uh, I ran across a book that I highly recommend. I have a four-page summary of it that I will email to anybody who would like it. But uh, there are a number of factors that can help you uh, to live longer. Uh, for me, uh, the most important factor is my religion. I have a lot of faith in God and in Jesus Christ and um, am, am devoted to that. And as it talks about here, I, I uh, participate in a lot of service and uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing for me. I, I sought out positive emotions. My wife and I would watch funny videos every day at lunch at work. Uh, I, I've uh, watched a lot of uplifting videos. My current favorites are both uh, Dry Bar Comedy and uh, AGT and, and BGT, the uh, Got Talent uh, shows from the U.S. and, and England. I, I have sought out positive social interactions. I try to go around wearing a smile. I used to be uh, kind of a glum person with the depression, but I try, I try to do that. I've tried to go for healthy food choices, and I've been moving toward veganism, although it's really more pescatarian because I eat fish as well. I try to follow intuitions. I believe in intuitions and the guidance that we can receive from our higher power, as some people are wont to call it. Uh, I believe in exercise, and I'll show you that a little bit later. Lots and lots of service. Uh, I'm the neighborhood repairman for all the houses, uh, for all my neighbors that have something break. Um, I lo love to help out people. I love to take phone calls and help with information that I have. And I have some reasons to live. You saw it in the slide of the five children. Uh, I feel like I have a, a service to perform here, and I love life, and I'm... Uh, happy to be um, continuing in it. Um, eliminating emotional baggage. I was raised in a dysfunctional family, as many people are, and eliminating that has been liberating. Uh, and I also use what I generically refer to as energy medicine, uh, muscle testing for uh, choosing supplements. There's 10,000 or, or 100,000 supplements out, of there, out there. What do you use? And uh, I have two doctors that help me choose what would work for my body, and, and I think it, it, it's effective. I'll, I also believe in something called grounding, which I talked about more in my 2018 talk, which uh, you can look at those. Uh, well, I can give you the, the slides for them. Uh, you could get the DVD, uh, or you can look at the uh, summary from the, um, the meeting, the roundtable meeting that year. So, with those changes, going to the triple antigen blockade and these lifestyle choices, uh, nine months later, in March 2017, from 100, I was down to two barely detectable metastases, and my PSA was near zero. Okay, I've got a letter from Dr. Schwartzberg who said, I've never seen that happen before. It was pretty exciting. And I also want to show that as soon as I turned 65, I ab abandoned a certain uh, organization that I felt uh, was not meeting my needs because they, they learned I had cancer and they kind of hung their heads and they said, you're going to be dead in three years. And I just didn't like that. So I went over to prostate oncology specialists. This was my photo there. Uh, I dabbled with them for a year or so. but. Even though, well, I think Dr. Lamb is a bit of an out-of-the-box thinker, but the other ones that I had talked to, 
um, I, I, I got led to another doctor called uh, Compassionate Oncology Medical Group, and I've had uh, treatment there since because they have a uh, very unusual approach to uh, treatments. Besides the triple androgen blockade, I went on Zytiga and Firmagon. I had a kinder, gentler chemo, which is three weeks of chemo fo followed by a week off, and then three weeks of chemo that I can give you details about. Um, it includes an anti-angiogenesis cocktail, that is uh, uh, drugs that are designed to help keep the the cancer from growing large enough that it wants its own blood supply. Um, and uh, so uh, there's um, the drug that I was given was um, uh, the baby killer drug. Um, Thalidomide, thank you. I just had a mental block there. Thalidomide, uh, which was tough on ladies and their pregnancies if it was given for um, morning sickness, but has since been found to have some bona fide medical uses. And since I don't expect to ever be pregnant, it worked out for me. <laughs> so uh, I had a couple of peaks along the way. Uh, Dr. Uh, Leibowitz, who was my doctor, and Dr. Ashegi and his partner feel that being on ADT for more than nine months gives the, chan the cancer a chance to uh, figure out how to get around it. And so after nine months, we would go on some kind of change in therapy. And I did high testosterone, sometimes called BAT, and uh, uh, also the chemo were the, were the uh, changes that I made there. And so I, had, I, I did, did again have a couple of peaks along the way. One was 17, and the more recent one was 41. But not to worry, the, it's under control. I'm in their, in their good hands. My current PSA is 4.6 on Zytiga and Orgovix, the new drug that you can take orally instead of the jabs in the belly or the butt with uh, uh, Firmagon or Lupron. There's an interesting situation there. I would really like to get uh, Zofigo, uh, but I need to be qualified for insurance coverage, okay? You've got to be castrate resistant, okay? I'm not. If, uh, 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 the PSA, as you can see, has been going down from 41. Uh, I tried using just Zytiga alone, and uh, uh, it got to a certain point where it bumped up a month, and I said, hmm, well, I guess I better take the, the Firmagon or the Orgovix as well. I went to Dr. Dotto, and he said, you've got to have two up PSAs before you're considered castrate resistant and before insurance will pay for this. And so I tried to get my PSA to go up. <laughs> How many of you have tried to do that? Well, <laughs> I went off a bunch of my supplements that I thought were helping me keep down. I had to stay on the hard drugs, you know, but I, I could take away some of the extra stuff. The, my PSA went down. How disappointing. But uh, this last uh, uh, PSA that I got went from 4.4 to 4.6. So if, if that counts, I'm on my way to getting my Zofigo, which is the radiation treatment that they put in your blood, seeks out the cancer in the bones, and, and kills it. So that would be exciting if I can move on uh, to that treatment. So for the rest of the talk, um, I would like to spend some time sharing with you uh, information that I'm putting together in a book on prostate cancer. Uh, a friend said, you ought to write a book. And I said, okay. And I've almost regretted it because it's a lot of work. But it's exciting to try and bring together uh, information that can be helpful. And so I'm going to run through things here. Uh, there's still another um, probably 20 slides, uh, but we'll, we'll skip over things. And as I go through, you'll find that I'm trying to point out where we've had speakers on a particular topic that you really ought to go back and try and take a look at. So, uh, for instance, here in this first point, Frank Tamburi spoke to us in November 2019. Wonderful man. Rode over on his Harley Davidson uh, to, to meet with us from Arizona with his ponytail fla flapping in the wind and has a very refreshing approach to things. Uh, so, he talked about 
is it cancer? Is it serious? What and when do I need to decide? And so you ought to see his, his uh, uh, video via a DVD, or I did a pretty good summary of it in the newsletter in November. So how do we find prostate cancer? Typically, uh, either symptoms show up, especially urination problems, uh, or a digital rectal exam, or a PSA test, which sometimes nowadays you know you have to beg for. I've had some friends who said uh, that their uh, health system refuses to let them get a PSA. And so I had to point out, here's another doctor outside the system. You're going to pay out of pocket to see him. Uh, you're going to, uh, his insurance company will actually cover it. It's just that his health system wouldn't authorize it. So he's going to go forward with that. So is it serious? Well, it's a, a a very important number is the Gleason score, and when you get a Gleason score, you should always get your sample sent off to Johns Hopkins, to Dr. Jonathan Epstein, to get a reread on it. Mine initially was eight, and he said, nope, it's a nine. And the question is also that you want to find out, is it contained within the prostate? Is it extended in the seminal vesicles like mine was, or into nearby lymph nodes, or is it metastatic? And of course, mine was wildly metastatic. What and when do I need to decide? Typically, when we first find out we have prostate cancer, it seems like there's a big rush into treatment. And the message that I try to promulgate in, in the book in here is you do have time. You need to stand back and look at the big picture. We need to get informed here, everywhere. Choose to be part of the long tail. Uh, in a lot of our talks, uh, when, when the effects of medicines are talked about, you're looking at the 50% uh, mortality time, okay, time to to half of the people die, and, and this is the extension of life that, that the drug can offer you on average. But if you look at those graphs, there's still people alive after 50% are dead, and some of them are alive for a very long time, like Gene, okay? <clears throat> and I would say, now that I've had uh, metastatic prostate cancer for seven years, I'm part of that long tail, and I invite you to be part of the long tail in your, with your prostate cancer. Uh, many people consider that prostate, getting prostate cancer is a bit of a divine tap on the shoulder that says, think about your life, think about what you're doing, um, make some changes, and I would say go back to those lifestyle factors and see how much your life can be uh, joyous uh, rather than depressed. So take control of your health as we try to do here. Follow intuitions again. Choose your doctor carefully. We'll talk about that more in a minute and get second opinions. Yeah. So um, uh, a couple of comments on about diet, uh, both food and supplements. Uh, the two most recommended diets are the Mediterranean diet, which you can read all about in the book called The China Study, which you could have bought from us if we brought the library and we need a librarian, um, or the rainbow diet, which you can look up on Google, which is pretty similar. So those are kind of go together, or a vegan diet. And uh, I believe uh, Bill Manning is still mostly vegan. Um, he's nodding yes. And uh, he's, he's been going more than 10 years with that, and that's, uh, he's a good resource for that. Um, there's another alternative that we learned about uh, in August. Uh, Dr. Robert Hoffman came and talked to us about a low methionine diet. And people have asked me about that, and my comment has been very interesting that you would uh, try and restrict this particular amino acid, and uh, that can help you live longer. However, uh, it's got good information in animal studies, but it's still only anecdotal in people. But it's something to consider. He has a Saturday morning uh, group that they talk about their experiences, and you know that's part of your information. Myself, I take about 40 supplements, some daily, uh, others not as often, chosen with the help of my two holistic doctor friends. 
And as suggested by a book called How to Starve Cancer by a young lady named Jane McClelland, I love the book so much, I made a summary of it, 22 pages instead of 380. And if you would like the summary, just let me know by phone or email, and I will roll it forward to you. But she had terrible cancer um, and a terrible health system in England. And so they treated her first cancer, said you've got seven to nine months to live. She didn't like that. So she went on PubMed and searched out anything that could possibly help her and managed to survive a little bit long enough to get another cancer because of the treatment her health system gave her um, and has overcome that and it's been more than 20 years and she has searched through and found 17 different biochemical pathways that your cancer will try to use to keep alive and keep growing and that you may want to uh, consider blocking using various supplements and repurposed drugs. So uh, you're welcome to get that uh, book summary from me. Exercise. It's been pretty well proven by studies that you will live twice as long after diagnosis if you exercise compared to not exercising. I exercise with that nice motorized bicycle up and down the hills in Chula Vista going back and forth to work 10 miles each way about four days a week because I get interrupted by medical treatments and so forth. But the other thing I really like is my other favorite word, worker size. And so there's uh, four retaining walls, uh, um, uh, nearly 50 feet long, that I built in the backyard up the hill. Uh, ripped out the back lawn to get a, a credit from the um, uh, water authority. And uh, my current project this afternoon, if it, the rain continues to hold off, will be to uh, build a sidewalk extension along one side of my house. I just love work. I hated it as a kid. Dad said, I want to teach you kids to love to work. And we thought he was crazy, but he wasn't. We are crazy. Minimizing stress is one of the things in the lifestyle factors. And so there's a couple of chapters here in my book that go through this. Dump your bucket of negative emotions. Just let them go. Just, just let them go. And release suppressed emotions. And, and in her book, um, Dr. Um, the, the, the author of the book, um, I'm having a senior moment here, uh, Turner. Uh, Dr. Turner says uh, it's different to release suppressed emotions as as well as dumping negative emotions. And so it, it's fun to read her book or my summary. My father and I were each diagnosed about four years after a major stressful event in our lives. He had a divorce after 34 years of marriage, and I had a heart attack and bankruptcy in the same year. Emotional helps, I've mentioned positive emotions, positive people, relationships, service, and religion, as well as strong reasons for living. These can help you stay alive. Okay, let's talk about some of the nitty gritty of, of our cancer. PSA, if I were to ask you what's PSA, I suspect few of you could give a real, real answer. Well, I'm gonna give it to you here. Prostate, specific antigen means that it's something that came from the prostate and upsets rabbits, okay? It's an antigen to rabbits. They have a, a um, uh, immunological response uh, uh, um, and they said, oh, there's something there. And they went back and found out it came from the prostate and then discovered that it was kind of an indicator for prostate cancer. It really should be named prostate-specific enzyme or prostate-sourced enzyme, okay? That'd be like a PSE instead of a PSA. Or you could really go uh, wild and say it's a prostate-exuded enzyme, P-E-E. -E. <laughs> okay. Now, what is it? It's a pregnancy-promoting enzyme. It liquefies ejaculated semen and allows the sperm to swim freely. It is also believed to help in dissolving cervical mucus to promote the entry of sperm into the uterus, okay? So the PSA is about 
pregnancy or about promoting pregnancy. What can raise the PSA? Well, there's some standard answers, and, and Frank Tamburi did a great job of describing these in his talk. Prostatitis, that is irritation of the prostate, uh, can come from in, uh, inflammation by compressing the prostate, by infection, or by disease. Doctors often prescribe a, an antibiotic to test the idea that the PSA rises due to infection, because you don't know. Uh, BPH, uh, which is benign prostatic hypertrophy, uh, means that you've got more cells than usual in your prostate, usually but not always making it larger. Three out of four men will have BPH by the age of 70. Many of the signs and symptoms are similar to prostate cancer, and it can be treated with medication in most cases, although there's some other treatments that I won't go into here. As I said before, ejaculate, well, PSA is related to pregnancy, and so, of course, it rises with ejaculation, okay? I think you squirt out some, and your body says, oh, I need to make more. But I'd like to tell you a little story. Now, in that picture of my backyard, you are seeing some of my 38 fruit trees, okay? I have another six in one neighbor's yard and two more in another neighbor's yard, because um, I love fruit trees, and I, between a friend and I, we've done about 50 graphs of grabbing a chunk of one tree and moving it over, over to another. But I have two fruit trees that were getting old, and they decided that they were gonna retire and not produce, produce apricots anymore. Well, I have an older brother who's a gentleman farmer in Utah on four acres, and he said, girdle it. Take a sharp knife and go around the trunk and cut through the bark, and that'll make the tree produce fruit again. And it's like, what? Well, the tree says, ah, I've been damaged. I'm going to die. Produce babies. Produce fruit. And, and five years ago, I, I did that treatment, and you can see one of the trees here. And uh, those trees, again, produce fruit. Now... Cancer and PSA, is that a little bit like that? Your, your body is under attack, your body is damaged, your body says, produce babies, send out more PSA. I think, I mean, it's a, it's a theory anyway, right? <laughs> so uh, if we're gonna try and find the cancer and treat it properly, we do need to have some imaging. Uh, MRI is very important, and I think uh, we might sometimes now try to skip on to PSMA, but uh, MRI can uh, localize cancer. Uh, there's, a, there's a parameter. It's actually multi-parametric MRI, uh, and one of the parameters is the water diffusion coefficient, and it is a very strong indicator of whether some area in your prostate is actually cancerous because for some reason in prostate cancer, the cells pack closer together and the water doesn't diffuse around as easily because it's all crowded. And um, so they can, they can read this parameter. And doctors don't normally tell you that after your scan. And I want to encourage people to say, I need to know my DWI. I need to know my water diffusion coefficient. Um, color Doppler I put in brackets because it's going out of favor. Uh, our favorite doctor that did it is, has retired and nobody's too sure about his replacements. Um, the PSMA test is very important nowadays and is being allowed more and more. It was at first only offered in, in uh, UCLA and UCSF, but now that there's a new version of the test called Pilarify, uh, I've been told that there are like 15 different centers here in San Diego uh, that will offer it, and the insurance companies are getting more uh, willing to do it. And so uh, I think I talk about it again later, but it's uh, uh, a radioactive material that is put into your body. It finds cancer anywhere in your body and lights up uh, those spots so that you can tell exactly is it contained? Is it extended? Is it metastatic? Where is it metastatic? And so forth. So after you get those kinds of scans, if you're new to your prostate cancer, then you 
in my opinion, do not want to get a random or so-called systematic biopsy, standard 12 cores jabbed in through your rump, but an MRI first or a PSMA if you can get it, either one of those two that are shown there on the slides, and then a targeted in bore or fusion biopsy. Either you're in the bore with the machine or they take a previous MRI and fuse it with an ultrasound image and run around and check where you are. Possibly you might want to do it using the transperineal approach and I give a reference to that or it, it is possible to use micro ultrasound or whole body MRI to try and uh, locate the cancer. In many cases, a blood test would come first. In a recent issue of Prostatepedia in June, uh, they had a couple of doctors who talked about the difficulty they have to get men to come in for their PSA tests and their follow-up tests. And uh, one of these tests, uh, the XODX test, is apparently actually available at an at, as an at-home test so that people who don't want to see the doctor can get a kit sent to them and then it can tell you something about the seriousness of your disease. And I'll comment here, all of these slides can be emailed to you if you'd like details and so you don't need to be uh, urgently scratching down uh, notes on everything. <clears throat> I have another chapter on active surveillance. Uh, Bill Manning is our expert. AP. Uh, ASPI.org is a great uh, resource, but I think we already saw that a number of you uh, are on active surveillance, and Dr. Uh, um, Galis, I think, said that they, they have this high percentage of men who uh, have very low risk uh, or low risk cancer and go on active surveillance. I think it's a wonderful thing. It puts off all the horrible side effects of getting treated until you really need to be treated. But of course, it does need to be active surveillance. Okay, there's a bunch of treatments that we can go through. I think we're doing okay on time. Um, Okay, surgery, a uh, number of you have had surgery. Uh, more and more, if you get it now, it would be robotic. Um, a, a, a long time alternative to surgery now has been radiation, either using photons uh, or protons, photons being basically x-rays, um, and that can be done in a number of ways. The traditional radiation was like 40 or 45 treatments uh, on separate days. Uh, then they started moving to fewer and fewer treatments coming down to uh, SBRT, uh, which is, uh, I think, in many cases, only five treatments, but at a higher dose uh, for each treatment. Often it's done with something called the space or gel, which is supposed to move the prostate away from the rectum so you don't burn the rectum like a friend of mine had recently and had terrible problems, despite the gel. And, uh, a third treatment modality is hormone treatment, which is what I've had, uh, which is a way of suppressing the activity of testosterone, which is uh, uh, necessary for the growth of the, of the cancer. And so the traditional ones are either Lupron or similar brand names like Eligard, uh, which was the, typically a three-month shot in the rump. Firmagon, which is a shot in the belly, which I've commented in some of our newsletters, doesn't need to be as painful if it's done right. Uh, and then newer drugs, uh, Extandi and Zytiga. My favorite by far is Zytiga. The reason is that um, going back to Casadex, which I had, it's like duct tape on the receptors of the, of the prostate for the testosterone. Uh, Lupron tries to suppress the uh, production of, est uh, of testosterone by overstimulating its production. Uh, you overstimulate it and the body says, but I'm tired of that, I'm going to retire and not produce anymore. Firmagon blocks it directly. And so where uh, Lupron takes a while 
for your body to adjust to that, and you may need um, uh, some help to prevent uh, a flare of testosterone and of a disease, which may be uh, very painful if you've got pain from your disease. Um, the Firmagon acts more quickly. Then Xtandi is kind of a super casodex, super duct tape on the receptors. Zytiga, my friend, is active in three different ways. It stops production in the um, testes, in, in the testicles. It also stops the production in the adrenal glands, which is where 10% comes from, and it prevents the cancer cells from making their own, which uh, in many cases they start to learn to do. And so that's a wonderful thing. And then the second wonderful thing about it is that it has a very uh, strong response to whether you take it with food or not. And the manufacturers of the drug found that if people took it with food, that their blood levels varied quite a bit. And they said, well, that's not good. Let's give it to them fasting. The only trouble is you need four times as much drug if you take it when fasting. Or if you do like I do and take it with food, you take a quarter dose, uh, which is a lot cheaper, especially when it used to be non-generic, and uh, you get two and a half to four times as much blood level. And fortunately, the drug has a huge safety margin. So, you know, if I were in charge, I'd have everybody on Zytiga with food. But that's a personal decision. So going back to the decision process, this is pretty straightforward. And so I'm going to just skip forward, gather lots of information. Do you want long life or do you want quality of life? And I don't know what happened to my slide, why it's a black type all of a sudden. Um, so you want to you want to think about it. Typically, uh, young people want long life. Typically, older people want quality of life because they realize they may not have that much time left anyway. And why why you know why struggle against a, a, a flood? Your doctor. The key point here is if you are not happy with your doctor, go get a different one. You do not have to put up with a doctor that's uh, not doing what you want. So uh, get second opinions and lean towards getting a medical oncologist on your team, if not your primary doctor. My, my primary doctor for my cancer is a medical oncologist up there at Compassionate Oncology. So what is the personality of your cancer? This is again from, from uh, Frank Tamburi. Is it like a day at the beach? Calm and relaxed and slow? Well, a lot of people with low risk prostate cancer, it's really that way. It's, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to cause you symptoms. Uh, your cancer might be of that type. On the other hand, it might be a raging forest fire burning its way towards you. That's me. <clears throat> or something in between. Uh, the PSA test uh, result is a key number. Um, uh, and I don't know where if I put it in here, but as far as I'm concerned, the PSA is a check engine light, okay? If your PSA goes up, it means you ought to take a look. It might be any of those three things uh, or four things that cause your PSA to go up, but you, you need to look into it if, it if it goes up. And it was a terrible thing when the medical profession said, don't get PSA tests, and it caused a whole lot of people to delay being diagnosed until their cancer was metastatic, serious, and eventually fatal. So anyway, be, beyond that is the Gleason score. I totally believe in the importance of the Gleason score, and then imaging scans like we've just talked about. Uh, there are lots of resources. Uh, a prime one that I would point out is Dr. Mark Schultz's book, The Key to Prostate Cancer. Uh, there's a whole list of these on the website, uh, an ipcsg.org. And if you've got a new member packet, a lot of them are listed there as well. But you can just go to the website. Uh, wonderful books out there, including mine upcoming, right? <laughs> So uh, we already talked about, let's see, did I miss something? Let me check that. Okay, no. 
Um, so I commented on, on uh, uh, other information that can be helpful, like blood and urine tests. Um, and I also comment here uh, uh, about this Frank Tambouri. I just loved his talk. But I want to comment that in February, we've got an upcoming talk where I've asked Dr. Dotto to come in and talk to us about new tests, uh, both the new scans as well as new blood tests, genetic tests, uh, et cetera. And I th I, I'm really looking forward to that talk. Uh, new science, new treatments, starting with new drugs. Okay, Xtandi, which I've mentioned already, and two newer versions of it are anti-androgens. They're, they're the duct tape, okay, and, uh, with a, lot of, a couple of other little details that I've thrown in here. Uh, apparently, they're all about equally effective, but I favor Zytiga. Now, uh, you can take a second drug with Zytiga. Prednisone. Yes. Yeah, you're recommended to take a second drug with, with Zytiga. I don't. I talked to my doctor and he said, prednisone is terrible, awful, horrible stuff. Why would you want to take prednisone? And so he said, let's, let's watch your blood values very carefully because uh, one of the main things that not having prednisone does is that cause your calcium to go, your potassium to go low. And I take potassium anyway for uh, preventing um, leg cramps at night. And so we washed my blood values, and I've taken uh, Zytiga, you know, for three different episodes for over, I think, over two years now, and never, never took prednisone. Personal choice. You know, there is a risk of blood clots, and I'm taking that risk, hoping that my supplements are, are helping cover that. So... Uh, you'll have to choose. Thank you for the question, though. Uh, so uh, originally, people would get Lupron or the like, and when you became castrate-resistant on that, then they would add these other things. And now more and more people are starting with uh, these so-called second-generation drugs in addition to Lupron, Zyte, um, Firmagon, or the new Orgovix oral pill. Uh, relatively right away. And my doctor wanted me to take chemo right away when I switched to compassionate oncology. I'll take a question. Did you say what castrate resistant is? Oh, yeah. A castrate resistant means you, officially that your, P, that your testosterone level in your body is below 50 instead of a normal range of like 3 to 800 and normal is different for different men, and so the range is very wide. Anything in that range is considered quote-unquote normal. But if you're down below 50, they say you're essentially castrated, okay? You're, you're not producing the normal levels of testosterone. And if your cancer is growing when you have that low a testosterone level, that's considered castrate-resistant. You're resistant to the lack of testosterone, okay? So my doctor wanted me to take chemo, and he had to talk me into it because I considered chemo to be death on your immune system. And, and he told me that, no, uh, it really isn't, especially the way he does it. And he was right. I don't feel like my immune system was, was uh, clobbered by that treatment. And my PSA did go to, like, zero. Okay, Provenge is an immunotherapy. I'm not crazy about it, but we just got a request from the from the uh, sales lady uh, for it, and we're going to try and bring her and a doctor in sometime next year to talk about it. But uh, I looked at the data for it, and it was like four years average life extension for $100,000. I wasn't terribly impressed. Okay, you know, I'll go ahead and die. Forget it. <laughs> Okay, so Figo, this is the one I want to get. This is the one in your in your blood, and uh, here's an explanation for it, and you you can check it out. Okay, the the uh, the more exciting things that that's coming up, uh, the lutetium 177. Okay, so far uh, you either have radiation like a PSMA test with a little bit of radiation enough to detect where the cancer is, or in the case of Zofigo. 
enough radiation that it would be active, but only at very short distances and only, hopefully, only when attached to the cancer. It's the way it's designed to be. Uh, lutetium is a, is a pretty strong radioactive element, and they attach it to a ligand that is something, uh, and uh, stick it in your body, and it runs around, and it finds uh, that same PSMA protein that the PSMA scans looked for, but using the, the mild radioactivity just for scanning purposes. It gives a lethal dose at those, at those locations. Uh, it's potentially wonderful new stuff. However, at the bottom here, I say Dr. Lamb, when he spoke to us recently, said that in their experience at prostate oncology specialists, uh, they have resulted in blockage of P prostate cancer growth from months to a year. So although we'd love to have an actual cure, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case, and there may be some other treatments that may be needed after that, you know, postponing things is great. I'm not sure what the cost to the insurance company is, but I don't think it's cheap. I'd like to remind you of something we learned about in August. Um, it's, a, it's a new version of a lutetium drug coming along from a company in Australia called TLX591. And it was an interesting talk because the, uh, the rep from the company came and talked to us about wonderful results they were getting. And then she went home and her legal department said, uh-oh, you said too much. And so uh, we only have the slides and not my summary of what she said in the, in the newsletter. But I'm telling you that I was excited about what she said. Instead of attaching the lutetium to a little molecule, that will attach and then eventually get washed away. Uh, so you need six treatments, typically six weeks apart. They've attached the lutetium to a, uh, an, an antibody, a monoclonal antibody as they're called, and it sticks much more strongly and doesn't get washed away. And so instead of six treatments over oh, nine months, is it? Uh, you get two treatments over two weeks. And the results that she mentioned that looked like they were getting were pretty exciting to me. So I'm, I'm hoping to the Zofigo will keep me going long enough so I can get this later on. Immunotherapies uh, are exciting for many cancers, not so exciting for prostate cancer. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, new tests, uh, I basically already said, we're looking forward to Dr. Dotto. Um, new procedures, there's improvements in prostatectomies, of course, the robotic surgery, so-called nerve-sparing surgery, which some people say helps and some people say, eh, it's vaporware. But I'd like to mention post-surgery follow-up. Dr. Mike Shea came and talked to us, and his uh, talk is summarized in the October newsletter. And I thought it was a game-changing talk because he talked about uh, follow-up after surgery and how you can recover uh, the things that you lose, which is like continence and, and or, uh, potency and all of those kinds of things. There are ways that he can work through. And, and that's very exciting, whether you're contemplating it, whether you've had it, you ought to look at that and maybe consider going and seeing him. I was, I was just blown away about how valuable that talk was. And then on radiation, I kind of already hinted that we've gone to more and more short courses on the radiation. Um, we're almost wrapping up. And uh, there are focal therapies. Uh, the therapies we've talked about uh, generally kind of affect the whole prostate. <coughs> Excuse me. It is possible to give radiation to a specific area that tends to be more used for uh, a small number of metastases. But these other things uh, tend to be used more. Well, cryotherapy, uh, I wish I had more information on it. I'd love to have a speaker in here on it. The guy who used to do it uh, retired, and I hardly know where to send people now. 
but I consider it a great thing for this reason. There's something called an abscopal effect, which means you kill the cancer, but don't obliterate it into a million smithereens all mangled. You just kill it gently. And then the immune system comes over and it says, hmm, something dead. I wonder if uh, there's more of this around somewhere. Maybe I ought to go look for it. And it goes around and looks in the rest of your body and has a chance of, of destroying the cancer elsewhere. Hmm, maybe the possibility of a cure. Oh, that would be great. Well, um, cryotherapy is one of the best uh, for that, and it's covered by insurance. Wow, what a deal if we only had somebody who would administer to it to us. My wife keeps telling me, you ought to go get cryotherapy and, and uh, you know, destroy the mothership that's sending out all of these, these little uh, uh, <laughs> uh, shuttles to, to put cancer elsewhere. It would be great. Um, one that I think is even better, but isn't covered by insurance, is IRE, irreversible electroporation, kind of a mouthful also called nano knife. And uh, there's, uh, I put one uh, newsletter reference here. Uh, there's another one that I can, another summary that I can send you. It was, the talk was before I started taking on the, the newsletter summaries, but I made a summary later because I thought the talk was so important. I, I consider that would be my absolute favorite if I could get uh, insurance coverage. And then there's focal laser therapy, which is a close uh, runner-up to that. Uh, Bernadette Greenwood is a wonderful lady, has talked to us a couple of times about it, and I highly recommend looking at those summaries and, and considering that option. And then finally, HIFU, uh, high-intensity focused ultrasound. We had a talk recently about that, and I consider it... Uh, it's a little, uh, I think, a little bit uh, tougher on the prostate cells, uh, therefore less immune stimulation effect in my mind, and I think the margins are a little bit less tight than on IRE and focal laser therapy. And then coming to a close, <clears throat> uh, the biome is way important. That's your gut and the, and the uh, critters that live in your gut. They represent about 70% of your immune system and a lot of your moods, uh, a lot of your health. And, and I recommend that we learn more about that. Uh, I'll try and get somebody to come in and talk to us about that one of these first days. And then uh, uh, alternative medicine is something that I use as indicated there. And then finally, my prostate cancer book uh, can be sent to you by email as well as these slides. Uh, just a couple of uh, trivial things that uh, I found to be helps in my ca prostate cancer journey. I got peripheral neuropathy from the chemo and from the thalidomide, and uh, we found that an ordinary car buffer, uh, particularly with a speed control on it, which I had from my lab because I'm a chemist, uh, uh, does a great job a minute on each uh, foot at night, and and my neuropathy is cut down by a third to a half. And so I'm standing here a pretty happy camper because I got Zorch last night, just before midnight. Uh, and then the other thing is that a lot of these treatments give us uh, diarrhea. Uh, I'm one of the 12% of people who are blessed with diarrhea from Orgovix. And so um, uh, Aaron Lamb pointed out that he had learned that the one on the left, pure encapsulations, uh, digestive enzymes, cured him in three days, cured me in three days, and then I found that there's this other brand. It's only four times cheaper. Hmm, that's attractive. And it works just about as well if I'm very careful to take a couple of them with each meal. meal. Thank you. Appreciate your time. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Bill. Uh, we'll take some questions for, I think, the next uh, 25 minutes or so, and then Bill has been kind enough to put a crew together to uh, offer us lunch. Do you want to say anything about the lunch stuff? I hope it's out there. I, um, I did see Bob bringing a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, cartons in, so, okay. yeah. Um, we set up for 100 people, so there's lots of lunch. I'm sorry, there's lots of lunch. Yes, what? You made our uh, performance. 
Proton therapy? Yeah, I'm sorry. When I I blasted right past it. You can get photons or protons, and in my humble opinion, it's not proven if one is better than the other. Protons are more expensive, and they're more precise for some purposes. But in, in general, uh, it seems to be relatively equivalent. It's a you know, it's of course a personal personal decision. Thank you for asking. Yeah, first I want to commend you for an excellent, thorough presentation, and I hope my oncologist is well as informed as you are. <laughs> Thank you. Now, th does that entitle me to at least a couple questions? Yeah. Because oh, I have more okay. than one. Okay. First of all, the Gleason score, I mean, we get it when we get that biopsy, and uh, it's a little difficult to understand, and we stay with that. And do uh, you ever get another check for other than a reread for a Gleason score again? I've, I've, uh, my understanding is that typically after you get a Gleason score of, uh, shall we say, of interest, like a high one, uh, you get treatment, and the treatments normally uh, scramble your prostate cells enough that if they come in and, and do another biopsy, it's, it's like gibberish, okay? So, uh, no, it doesn't seem to make sense to do another Gleason score. That's good to know because I don't think I want to go through that again. Well, yeah. Oh, I meant to say that. When you, when you get a high PSA, you often get sent to a urologist, okay? A urologist is a surgeon, as you should know. Uh, surgeons have knives. Surgeons love to use their knives, and they often will say, well, I have an opening just, you know, 10 days out. Uh, we, let's schedule you, okay? And then they, uh, they also uh, say, let's get you a biopsy. And, you know, in the old days, it was a, it was a so-called random biopsy. And it's horribly painful. I, I don't know if anybody has had a, one of those random biopsies that wasn't, uh, but <clears throat> it's really bad. And yet... When you get a, a, um, an MRI first, I had one of those, a uh, targeted biopsy. It was nothing. It was a little snip, and that was it, six of them, actually. So I've decided that, that the reason that when you go to a urologist and get a random biopsy is so that he can come up to you afterwards and put his arm around you and say, you don't ever want to go through that again, do you? If I take out your prostate, you won't ever have to have another random biopsy. What do you think? Okay, I, I do have many questions, but I'm, I'm going to limit. Because yeah, we'll have time afterwards for as, we, one, as we munch. For one, I'm a retired caregiver, retired pharmacist, and as most caregivers are, I'm a hypochondriac. Because you learn it, and then you say, I've got it. Mm -hmm. So my question is, because there's limited parameters for monitoring uh, prostate cancer, and uh, of course I'm worried about other cancers. So you, having had metastases and bone cancer, my thought is, or my fear is, because as a hypochondriac, what about the other cancers? Because we're looking at PSA, we're looking at scans, MRI, and the gold standard now, the PSMA, which I did have, and found that there's some spread in some lymph nodes that were contained in one area, and then they discovered that it has gone more than in that one area, so they don't want to give me more risk of radiation because even with the PSMA as specific as it is, they don't know where the other cancer cells are lurking. So we're talking about prostate cancer cells, but what about other cancer cells, especially you have metastases in the bone. What about bone cancers that are coming from other than prostate cancer? What about lung cancer? And what about all these other scary things? I just have to say, you know, good luck with that. It's a risk we all take every day. Uh, and, you know, we could go out of here and get run over by a bus. You know, life is very fragile. Uh, handle it with prayer and follow your intuitions and, and gather information. But I don't have those answers for you. Over here. It's I have actually, to say, you I, looked really interested as we went through this. I, I just love her as an as an audience member. Go well, ahead. it was fascinating, and I thank you for all that information. And I will be looking in 
my dad is the one fighting the prostate cancer, obviously, but I wanted to mention that when uh, he first was diagnosed, I found a forum online called Health Unlocked, specific to prostate cancer, and my dad has been able to find information that even his MO, medical oncologist, does not know about. Um, the resources you've mentioned are terrific. I did start taking some notes in my phone, but I will be able to contact you for more information, but thank you very much. It was excellent. Thank Health you. Unlocked. Okay, over here with the mask. Oh, uh, before we, we yeah. go to that one, um, yeah, one of the key things is that, uh, you know, take questions that you, um, I mean, there, a lot of the doctors do not want you to ask questions because they don't have the answers. But take those questions to them and say, hey, what about this? What about this treatment? You know, did you look into this? My doctor didn't send me for an MRI. Had I been with this group um, uh, at that time, before my 10 days before he scheduled my surgery, things would have been a little bit different. Um, so yeah, this is part of becoming your own ca a medical case manager. You know, when they don't, when they're not giving you the information that that you need, ask the hard questions. You know, get get them to research it themselves and um, uh, or find another uh, opinion. So who's next? Yeah, the mask. Um, I'd like to talk to somebody in the audience. I'd like to talk to someone in the audience that has had revenge. And secondly, someone who has experience with external catheters. And number three, have any of you experienced shortness of breath with exertion for which they can find no cause? I've got that shortness of breath with exertion, and, and yeah, they don't know what mine is either. Yeah, I have to be, I have to be kind of careful. I still pedal down the road madly uh, and, and you know work all day. But uh, you know, to run up a flight of stairs, I'm yeah. I'm puffing. Yeah, we'll we'll share if we could, if we ever find the answer. Oh, okay. Question down. Yeah. I'm hormone sensitive, and I would like to get Zofigo. How do I do it? Uh, check your bank account. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, like I said, I went, I, 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 okay, I deliberately went off certain supplements that I thought would let me rise up because my mind seems to be hovering in this four to five range. Um, so I went off of them and it went down a notch. Yeah. And the, let me ask a question. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so then I uh, ran out of some supplements. We happened to be broke that week, so I didn't re resupply, and and it bumped up a little bit. So, you know, all I can say is uh, uh, good luck and uh, hang in there until it goes um, uh, hormone resistant. Uh, let's let Gene answer. And and okay. I'm curious about that answer. I had Zofigo quite a few years ago. As a matter of fact, it took my PSA to the lowest it's ever been. But my insurance company paid for it. So I'm wondering what happened in between. Well, were you castrate sensitive? Yes. Well, okay. Yeah, so evidently the insurance companies that we're talking to are, are a little tougher now. I don't know. I, and I ask around, maybe... You Maybe there's a way past that. Yeah, you might remember that Bill was trying to increase his PSA, and he, he also mentioned that one of the ways to increase your PSA is um, have a lot of sex. Yeah. <laughs> so that can fluctuate. You know, for those of you that are you know, scrutinizing it when you're on active surveillance and you're scrutinizing, like, is this PSA moving? You know, for me, I mean, when I first started looking at it, it was around 11. But it might be 13 two weeks later, and then it might drop down to nine a couple months after that. It, there is a fair amount of movement, and sexual activity can uh, affect that. Okay. Uh, next question. Pat. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going over here first. Uh, I'd like to help answer this gentleman's question about Zytiga. I'm right in the middle of that, and I've been on it for about 20 months. And when I started, those pills were $200 a piece, and they wanted to, you to take four of them a day. So, yeah, that'll rip your wallet pretty good. Anyway, there's a group with scripts. There's a girl that runs the program. Her name is Jiminy, and she connects to a group 
that is owned by Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceuticals. It's called PAN, P-A-N. I don't know what that stands for. Uh, Patient Action Network or, or words to that effect. They, yep. And they picked up 100% of the cost. Yeah. Uh, the first grant I got was like $7,000 and change. The next one was 7000 but I just got a letter, and I'm approaching two years, and they have announced that on December 31, the grant is over for me. So whether that's for everybody or what the case is, I don't know. But let me tell you, Zytega does work. I was at 14-something, uh, and it drove it down to 0 0.06, and the scale doesn't go any lower than that. And it stayed that way for a long time. Zytega eventually starts to lose its effectiveness because the body, like many drugs gets used to it and it won't work like it used to so i'm starting to climb back up but i'm still at a three i recommend zytega okay here and then we'll come up to you two well just a minute we got a question here first yeah two two questions first i wonder how many uh, new cases are diagnosed as metastasized and second, I would like to talk to a gentleman someplace back here who was referred here by his uh, urologist, whoever that was. Did catch that? Okay. Okay. Um, so, how many people are, are found metastatic? I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's it's fairly low um, still, uh, especially now that we're doing PSA tests again. Yeah. Of course, with the pandemic, a lot of people have put off, you know, pursuing <laughs> investigation and they're That's finding, true. you know, more people it, it just in general with all cancers that are further along. Um, oh, metastases well, once under care. That, that's essentially, in, in some ways, recurrence, right? Because, uh, like, for example, I don't have a prostate anymore. If I have recurrence, it is going to be essentially elsewhere. Yeah. Let's get this microphone up there, even um, though you can shout. I, I know. One of the reasons for the microphone, too, is that we are recording the, uh, the, the meeting, and that meeting will be available online, uh, as will the slides. Uh, um, you can also pick up a DVD uh, for a copy of the, uh, of the whole meeting, so we want to be able to hear all the questions. Um, do you have any advice for people who are thinking about doing clinical trials? I'm in favor of clinical trials if they fit. You know, in many cases, you're running the risk of being in the placebo group. But if you can tolerate that risk, you know, in, in some cases, it's a great way to get new medicines for free. And um, can you tell people how they can find out about clinical trials? Because I think yeah. we have access to all of that through the... Well, clinicaltrials.gov. Okay. Right? Yeah. And by the way, you know, we ought to be wrapping up here and talk over lunch um, so that people who want to be done by noon can, can do that. Yeah, and please be sure to turn in your, your first page of your new member packet so that we can follow up with emails to you, uh, future meetings. Uh, you'll get the newsletter next month that will have this summary Yada, yada. Why don't we take two more questions and then we'll go to lunch. Okay. Uh, just a couple of quick comments on the Zytega. Uh, it does come in two doses, 1,000 milligrams. Um, when you get that, you pay through the nose. That's $2,500 copay if you are on Medicare. But it also comes in 250 milligrams. And on Medicare, that copay for the dosage that I was taking on that was uh, 200 bucks. A ten, you know, way cheaper. The other thing, too, is oh, I had to come off the Zytega. Liver function tests went through the roof, and I had to cancel it. So you do have to keep a close eye on your liver function tests when you're taking Zytega, because they, they just went up astronomically. Okay, and then one more. I'd like to clarify what my daughter said. In this period when we had the COVID, a wonderful supplement to these meetings, which I missed a lot, uh, and I'm so glad they're here again. Uh, the, all of the questions that have been asked here today have been asked on Advanced Cancer Care Health Unlocked, and it's a, a 501c3, and it's everybody. It's people like us. It's experts. They come, might be in New Zealand. 
Zealand or Australia or England or here. And it is a wonderful, because uh, all of the people will answer and they will qualify what their experience has been. The same kind of thing that's going on here. So this is a, a wonderful supplement to what you do here locally. Thank you. And then, Aaron, let's talk about the focus groups. That, yeah, that why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Um, Either way. Okay, as we break up, uh, we're going to invite you to group uh, into uh, uh, focus groups like we would normally do if we have a member speaking. Usually we'd have three members, but I'm such a blabbermouth, uh, I got the whole time. But uh, we're going to have um, Gene for advanced treatments, was it? Yeah, all kinds of treatments. Yeah. Uh, and Steve was going to take surgery? surgery? Okay. And you were going to take radiation. He's got his t-shirt, radiation survivor. And I'm going to take uh, undecideds. Bill. And Bill's going to take active surveillance. Okay. So if you have those kinds of questions, uh, uh, search around for each of us as we grab some lunch. And one thing is, is we're not allowed to bring food back into the auditorium. So please do keep all the food in the, in the uh, foyer. Uh, and there are uh, three tables outside if you'd like to sit down and chat with people down out to the right. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot for coming today, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.